I feel myself like a forensic detective working on cold cases, except that my cold cases are millions and millions of years old, but they're no less interesting. Today's guest is Gerda Keller, a professor of paleontology and geology in the geosciences department at Princeton University with a wonderful personality. Gerda has over 240 scientific publications focused on major earth catastrophes and mass extinctions, including the biotic and environmental effects of meteorite impacts and volcanism. In our conversation with Gerda, we cover her courageous journey against all odds in attaining a university degree, the mechanics of major earth catastrophes, the mystery surrounding the KT boundary and the dinosaur mass extinction, the impact theory and theory of Deccan volcanism, and the deep trials and tribulations of advocating for a non-consensus theory in the scientific community. As a heads up, this episode contains some explicit language. We'd love to learn more about your journey in, I guess, path to where you are today and maybe your journey into, into geology and, uh, and the geosciences. Um, that's a long way. So to make it short, well, you know, I'm, I'm originally Swiss. I grew up, uh, well, I was born in Liechtenstein. I, uh, my mother is from there and my father is Swiss. So I have um, those citizenships. I grew up in Switzerland, but um, uh, there was not much of an opportunity to get an education in Switzerland uh, because my parents had a dozen kids and they were poor. When I wanted to get more of an education, well, at the time in Switzerland at age 12, you had to make up your mind what you were going to do with your life. And when I was asked that question, I said I was going to be a doctor. So they sent me to a shrink and who would uh, uh, talk some sense into me. And the shrink gave me a Rorschach ink blood test and asked me to interpret it. And I said, it's a stupid ink blood test. And uh, she said, no, it is not. And I, uh, she said, uh, tell me what it tells you and, uh, and uh, I can tell you what you are going to do with your life. And I said, ask me, I'm going to be a doctor. So she said, no, you should be sensible. You're a poor kid. Your parents have no money. You're never going to be a doctor. You can be a sales girl, a housemaid, or a dressmaker. So those were my options. So um, I said among those options, I would never be any of those, but um, if I couldn't be a doctor, I would become a dress designer. So at 14, I entered my apprenticeship as dressmaker. I finished at 17 and a half and uh, went to work for Dior in Zurich but they didn't pay an eating wage. So um, I left because I couldn't afford a room and three meals a day. So I left after about a few months and decided if um, I couldn't do much that I wanted in Switzerland, I would um, travel the world. So I did. I started off with um, uh, going to England to learn English then to Spain, study Spanish, and then um, took off with a boyfriend and hitchhiked through North Africa. And uh, there were many adventures there, of course, including entering uh, Algeria during the coup d'etat of Ben Bella and uh, being allowed while everyone else was at the border waiting. I was allowed in simply because the border guards um, found me a pestering female and I had a Swiss passport which has a white cross on a red background. So they thought I was a Red Cross representative. 
and they allowed me in mm-hmm. along with my boyfriend. So we traveled through the country while uh, while it was locked down under military rule, actually. But in any case, these are long stories. Um, after that, um, after those travels, I emigrated to Australia in '65. So I was about 20, and uh, in Australia, I worked for a hospital, training as a nurse. They told told me there I should become a doctor, which I would have liked to, but I s- never had the education to pass the tests. So then uh, I was uh, in Australia after about 14 months there, I uh, was shot in a bank robbery. Wow. And uh, nearly died. And uh, after uh, recovery, I decided to travel, to continue my world travels through Southeast Asia, and eventually came to the United States in uh, during the uh, Flower Children days of uh, 67, 68. Uh, I arrived in San Francisco. Uh, there I was told that maybe I should consider going to school in the U.S. I was then uh, 22 years old, and I started at John Adams High School on the Haight-Ashbury because I didn't have a high school diploma. And then I was kicked out of that school um, after some tests, which I was told was an IQ test. And I was told, and after that, I was told I didn't belong there. So I went back to City College and asked. Uh, for my uh, application again, and I saw that there was uh, reading the fine print that if the, the high school burned down and its records were destroyed, then I could apply and take an exam. So I went back and I said my high school burned down, and uh, I took an exam, and that's how I got in. After wow. two years there. I went to City College, uh, not City, San Francisco State College. And after that, I went to Stanford for graduate school. So I started off at San Francisco State with archaeology and then switched into geology. And I switched into geology because there was an old teacher whom I asked why he became a geologist. And he said, Ah, if you like uh, traveling and if you like to sit at the beach and sipping a martini and watch the sun, (laughs) uh, then you should become a geologist because there are rocks everywhere in the world and you can always dream up a project and somebody will fund it for you. So I said that's good enough for me. So I became a geologist and I have never regretted it. I've traveled the world based on my geology research just about everywhere. That's the long story of how I became a geologist. And your desire was always to stay in academia, or have you ever moved into other parts of the economy, I guess, industry? There were plenty of opportunities, but um, I simply wanted to do what gives me pleasure. In other words, I'm rather selfish. I enjoy finding out, discovering what happened in the past and as a way to understand the present and what will happen in the future. And academia gave me the freedom to do so. And so, and that's really the motivation. There is not much money to be made there, I know that, but that didn't concern me at all, as long as there was enough to eat. And I find myself very fortunate that I can and lift my life and I uh, doing always what I wanted to do, the research I wanted to do, and uh, find discovering new things. And, and somebody was uh, paying my bills. Going back to your school days in Switzerland, you protested against 
the requirement of women needing to wear skirts. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, it was my first protest. How did that protest come to be? Well, I, I went to a more advanced uh, high school uh, called Realschule. It was uh, about almost three miles away from where I lived. And in winter, the, the roads were often unplowed and we had to go through deep snow. And wearing a skirt was very impractical and we froze like crazy. So I decided that um, wearing pants like the boys was a much easier way and um, we wouldn't get frostbites. But we had a, the teacher that ran the school, uh, one of them, he uh, did not like that. He was very strict and he took me aside and he said, you have to wear a skirt. And I said, I will not wear a skirt because it is freezing, the snow is too high, and we have to walk through it for a long time. And you can, simply cannot make me do so. It is not just. Eventually, he agreed and he said, okay, you can wear pants, but only until you get to the school and you have to bring your skirt and then you go and change. So every girl then, from then on, could wear pants. But of course, um, within a couple of weeks, none of us changed into skirts. <laughs> How old were you at this point? I was 13. What were your learning from this first experience of being a protester? Ah, what did I learn? Uh, sit through, if you, if you feel you're right, speak up and, um, and speak out, basically. Because all the other girls were afraid to speak out. And I was not. Your primary research focus is seemingly major catastrophes in Earth's history. Let's right. talk about what defines a major catastrophe. Do you have any working definition of that? Yes. Uh, for us uh, in geology, paleontology, a major catastrophe is a mass extinction that wipes out at least um, more than 65, 70% of life on Earth. And there are five of those in the last 500 million years. And the dinosaur mass extinction that defines the fifth and last mass extinction was 66 million years ago. And what you may not realize is that we are in the sixth we are actually in a mass extinction interval right now that uh, is faster than any of the five previous ones and in fact may, uh, may become more severe than the other ones. Expand on that. <laughs> yes. My study in mass extinction, uh, the, my interest was not just in finding out what happened at that time, but also, why does it happen? How does life continue after the mass extinctions? What can we learn about it? So what that has, uh, most of my studies have been for the mass extinction, the dinosaur mass extinction, 66 million years ago, but also at a major catastrophe, though not a mass extinction, at 57 million years ago, when the Earth warmed about 8 degrees centigrade. And it essentially killed off a lot of material, um, animals in the oceans and on land, but only over a very short period of time because there were others were survivors in higher latitudes and once conditions uh, to climate Earth cooled again, 
uh, normalized, then uh, they would uh, repopulate by moving back into the mid latitudes and the lower latitudes. So, um, so that we have a, a good scenario and a bad scenario. The good scenario is that uh, when you have rapid climate warming and the environment gets destroyed, you can survive in the good scenario by moving into higher latitudes where conditions will be survivable. Now the ba and then you can return and repopulate, although it will take thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand years to repopulate. The bad scenario is what happened to the dinosaurs, and we may be the next dinosaurs. Uh, in that scenario, the mass extinction happens worldwide, period. And uh, there is not much to survive, and the ones that die out are most severely hit are the highly specialized organisms. Dinosaurs were highly specialized, specialized for food sources, specialized for environmental conditions, even specialized to place. In the oceans, there is another group at the fo uh, base of the food chain that are called foraminifera, single-celled organisms that create calcium carbonate shells from the water and they died out except for one survivor which we call a disaster opportunist. It's still around today, you can't kill it. It's like one of the rats today or the cockroaches which may inherit the earth. Well, to come back to the bad scenario, we are in, in many ways like the dinosaurs. We are highly specialized. Try to survive in even increasing heat uh, without air conditioning in, uh, in our latitudes. It's not possible. Uh, we need specialized food sources. How many of us are still growing food or know how to grow to food? How, do we, how would we survive without all these things that we take for granted today? So in other words, we are at the top of the food chain and we are the most specialized guys. So just like under, among the foraminifera and the dinosaurs, we are main targets for the extinction, for the extinction that is ongoing now. So if I haven't scared you by now, <laughs> you should be. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that we are going through a phase of extinction. Yes, absolutely. It's, go, it's already called the sixth mass extinction, and it is expected to reach uh, the mass extinction level of about 70% of the species extinct uh, by no less, uh, by maximum about 250 years from now, and we will be perhaps much faster. Some predictions are that by 2075, uh, we may already be well into through into the mass extinction that even we can recognize. You mentioned that uh, these extinctions are predictable. Um, the extinctions are predictable, yes, because we know what climate change will do. You don't need an impact from outer space for uh, uh, for for any of the extinctions. In fact, we know now that all five previous major mass extinctions are associated with major volcanism and climate warming, including, of course, the dinosaur extinction. And that impacts, well, they happen all the time, but actually only, only one large one is associated with the dinosaur extinction, and the age is still highly uncertain. It, in my opinion, and all the evidence that I have accumulated over 30 years of study, the evidence shows that that mass extinction predates, uh, that impact predates the mass extinction. So if you strip away the hype of, of the impact, of the meteorite impact, then you're left with uh, 
the one thing that is common to all five mass extinction, and that is volcanism and climate warming. And uh, that is essentially what we can identify. Today we can identify the Deccan Traps volcanism of India with major, major climate warming uh, on a global scale already over the beginning about 300,000 years before the mass extinction and accelerating during uh, uh, during the last 100,000 years before the mass extinction, but particularly the last 30, 40,000 years where there is, I mean, there is absolutely paroxysmal volcanic eruptions that essentially create hyperthermal warming on Earth. And that ended with the mass extinction. So now I gave you something that most people don't know. Let's talk about the interdisciplinary nature of your field, Major Earth Catastrophes, or at least it seems to be heavily interdisciplinary. Could you give us some examples of that? It has to be interdisciplinary because if you want to understand how mass extinctions happen, uh, you can't do it with one field, with one discipline. So I was trained in paleontology, particularly marine organisms, microorganisms, and uh, I wouldn't be able to tell too much from those if I just wanted to study how beautiful they look and when they lived and when they disappeared. I still need to know um, why, why did they live at the time and why did they disappear? And for that, I have to go and see what was the, were the oceans like at the time? Um, what was the ocean temperature, the salinity, the oxygen content? Uh, what about ocean acidification? All of those things. So you need to know a little bit about the geochemistry of the oceans. But we also need to know what was the temperature. And the critters that I study indeed have the, they form these calcium carbonate shells in equilibrium with the water temperature and environmental conditions in which they live in, lived in. So they, these shells are actually used still today uh, to measure the temperature at the time they lived by using the oxygen isotopes and using and uh, we can get at the food sources and productivity at the time of the oceans by studying the carbon isotopes composition in those shells. So this is another area you need. Now, you want to find out what really killed them. So we have these two hypotheses or theories, if you will. Um, one is that the mass extinction 66 million years ago was caused by a major asteroid impact on Yucatan. The other is that it was volcanism in India. So how are you going to ch test that? Well, in order to do so, you've got to go out and understand, uh, first of all, collect some evidence of um, of this impact. What is the evidence? Well, the most sure evidence are in uh, glass spherules, very tiny glass spherules that are about um, an eighteenth of an inch and much less and even smaller. And they can be found in sediments. They are formed by uh, the impact on Yucatan by melting all the rocks and then blowing it into the atmosphere from where the, the melt rock essentially um, forms tiny glass spherules which then rain back onto Earth. So in a, within a radius of about one to 2,000 kilometers from the impact crater, we can find these spherules, glass spherules. So 
this is what we did, but then we also need to know uh, what are the sediments like in uh, at the time. In other words, what was the environment like when these glass burials rained down on Earth, and we can and on Earth as well as in the oceans. So we need to know something about the sediments. Under what conditions were they deposited? Uh, where did they come from? So we need, uh, that's still another field. Yet another field is what were the organisms that were living in these sediments? Now we are looking at worms in the oceans and crabs and uh, uh, all kinds of crustaceans. So once you can put all of that together, you can create some uh, understanding of the, the environment at the time and come up with some interpretation. So in, in India, this volcanism, which I started to study in uh, late 2000, uh, after I finished with the impact story studies, uh, it required still another set of tools. Now it was uh, volcanic eruptions. We needed to find exactly how could volcanic eruptions cause mass extinctions. So for that, um, I, for, for many years, a geophysicist and volcanologist who had worked in India for 20 years, his name is Vincent Cortillot, is a French and he was the director of Physique de Globe de Paris. And he would ask me, ever since the 80s, he would ask me, Gerda, when are you coming to India? And tell us where the mass extinction happened in the chicken traps. And I would say, just when you find a locality where you have marine sediments in between two volcanic flows, then I will be there. Because I study marine organisms and they give me age control over uh, what happened at the time. And uh, the volcanism in India is continental. So there is no marine there, except at the edges. So in 2006, he called me and he said, I have such an, uh, a section, I believe, and it is uh, on the East Coast and a place called, a city called Rajamundri. And um, I think this, this might be it. So off we went and studied that section, and he was right. It was the first discovery of the mass extinction in Deccan lava flows. Are there any fields or disciplines that you draw from that might come across as surprising or non obvious to someone external or who has little knowledge? of your field? Um, I never expected any of it. Is, you see, uh, looking at different fields, when you try to solve a problem, I'm sure this is no different from anybody in Silicon Valley too. When you try to f solve a problem, you have to draw on all different areas that could help you solve the problem, right? So uh, it's no different in, in the science we do. So in, in India, for instance, it, um, studying the Deccan traps and, the, and its role in the mass extinction required a, a, a different toolkit. And, and so we basically for the last 10 years, uh, we've been going to India and collect rocks and study the rocks and uh, try to figure out exactly what happened there. My paleontology background was not sufficient for that. I could certainly, and I have, identified where the mass extinction is and how, it, how quickly it happened there. But we still didn't have, for instance, any age control over when the lava erupted. So there were major, I mean, the lava eruptions uh, continued for a minimum of uh, 750,000 years. We, didn't, we needed age control that would tell us 
within something like 10,000 years or less when a particular lava flow erupted. So in order to do that, we, uh, there is a, a dating method that uses a uranium, uh, uh, uranium lead dating. And that's, it's done from a crystal that uh, crystallizes out of volcanic eruptions. It's called a zircon crystal. And that uh, can give you very, very high resolution age dates. So one floor down from me here at Princeton, uh, we had hired a, a specialist in that kind of dating, and his name is Blair Schoen. I went down to see him uh, about almost four years ago now, and I said, look, we need some age dates on the deck and lava flows. And nobody has ever been able to find the, uh, the zircon crystals. I, although they have tried, and he says, yes, I know, and there are none there, because the eruptions were, the cooling after the eruptions were very fast, so it didn't have time for the crystals to grow. So I said, I have an idea. Uh, there are these red clay layers called red balls in between lava flows. Not all, but in some. And if there are no zircon crystals in the lava flows, maybe they are in these red clay layers because these are really acid rain weathering of the underlying lava flows. He said he didn't believe it. And I said, okay, I have some money left from my research. I'll pay you for a field trip to India mm -hmm. and two of your students to collect some and I pay for some of the analysis. What can you lose? If, you, if, we are, if I'm right, you've made, it's make, it makes your career. If I'm wrong, then you had a good vacation. <laughs> and it didn't cost you a penny. It took them still a couple of months to, to agree. And uh, it was the sorriest field work bunch of people on a field trip that I've ever had. In what way? <laughs> it, it, because they were so depressed, saying every day, how, what a waste of time that they, I was wrong. Uh, there was no chance that there were zircon crystals in these uh, uh, red clay sediments. And it was just going on and on. And uh, one month after we were back and they had processed the samples, they had zircon crystals. And, uh, and since then, um, uh, we have now the highest age control of any lava flows on Earth. It's right in the Deccan. And we have figured out exactly when and where in the Deccan traps the mass extinction happened, which flows even down to the flows that may have caused them. Talks to the interdisciplinary work needed in this research. It, absolutely. Yeah. And there is still another story that we are working on right now. And that is uh, thinking further ahead. Uh, while we figured out what happened in the Deccan traps, we now needed to know how can we relate the Deccan traps to the mass extinction worldwide. And we needed some way of directly connecting the mass extinction, say, in Tunisia to India. And that's not easy. So uh, about five years ago, a couple of people, one a Canadian, Steve Grasby, and uh, one in China, found out that mercury from measurements of um, traps uh, called the Siberian traps, another large volcanic eruption, 200, uh, with the mass extinction uh, 251 million years ago, they found that there were huge ano mercury anomalies coinciding with the mass extinction, and that those anomalies came from the Deccan explosive, uh, not Deccan, explosive eruptions in Siberia. So I thought, and, and since then, by the way, 
these uh, mercury anomalies have been found associated with all mass extinctions. So I figured that if this is correct, then if we find a locality that has very high deposition, sedimentary deposition in the oceans, and measure the mercury in these sediments, then, then we can actually document exactly when the eruptions in India happened. In fact, so it was another uh, shot in the dark, a good guess, and this one worked out spectacularly. We now have a record in Tunisia that very miraculously uh, documents virtually the entire eruption history of Deccan volcanism. So now we, we can actually, uh, in that area as well as all around the world, exactly tie the mass extinction to the particular pulse of eruption in India. Could you shed some light on what is KT boundary and why does it matter? No, that's a good question. Uh, the KT boundary is uh, a very thin clay layer in between all other sedimentary accumulations through Earth's history. And in this clay layer, it sometimes is only millimeters thin, and sometimes um, maybe a, a few tens of centimeters. In this clay layer, at the very bottom is a what we call a red layer, and that red layer has anomalous concentrations of iridium. Iridium is very common in meteoritic material and therefore could come from an impact. But it is equally common in the center of the Earth, simply because the core of the Earth is made up exactly of the same material as all the space junk out there, because Earth formed from the space junk. And if volcanism like um, India's Deccan volcanism comes from the center of the Earth, what's called the mantle core interval, and erupts onto the surface, it produces the same amount of iridium. And that's actually, for every mass extinction, the volcanism came from very deep-seated, the center of the Earth, and those are the most deadly ones because of all the various chemicals that are in chunk that is put into the atmosphere and uh, causes, of course, acid rain, pollution, uh, greenhouse warming, short-term cooling, long-term warming. So the reason that all comes down to is that the KT boundary was originally defined by the mass extinction and the ceridium anomaly in this clay layer. And it is still... Uh, a very good explanation as to, but it went then further with the impact, um, uh, with the rise of the impact theory. They assume, and still assume today, that the iridium had all to come from this impact, and uh, Chicxulub impact. And then, uh, even though the impact Glass, the only direct evidence that ties uh, to the Chicxulub impact, uh, occurred in sediments up to 15 meters below the iridium anomaly. They came to define the impact as KT boundary based on the iridium anomaly and ignoring that this iridium anomaly can just as well be from volcanism, second volcanism, as from the impact. And furthermore, what we know today is that iridium in sediments can be mobilized and then re reconcentrated in the clay layer, which is impermeable to iridium and other chemicals. So, for example, if uh, iridium comes in into the uh, atmosphere from space, essentially at a constant rate, small amounts, so it's always in the sediments, but it's background level. And then there are, of course, there is of course iridium from volcanism. Now, if you take and of course impacts, 
Now, if you take this iridium from a what from a sedimentary column above this clay layer at the KP boundary, and you remobilize the iridium, it will reconcentrate exactly at the base of this clay layer, and that's what creates our iridium anomaly. That is not to say that there was not an impact, but we don't know whether that impact actually had any iridium because. Uh, many impacts, many um, ball leads from outer space that crash into Earth, they may be dirty snowballs, or they may be other uh, material that does not have iridium. So it's still a, a very much an open question. But now back to the definition of the iridium. So today, when people say that the impact occurred precisely at the KT boundary. It is based on this iridium anomaly, which is highly questionable. And they ignore completely the much better evidence of the glass impact glass burials that are interbedded in the sediments and much, much earlier on. So, did I answer your question on the KT boundary or make it more complicated? <laughs> make it more interesting, that's what I would say. <laughs> maybe both, maybe both. <laughs> Could you maybe outline the key existing theories? Okay. For, so, yeah, good. In 1980, the uh, Iridium was discovered in this thin clay layer that marks the KT boundary. And it was in, in a place called Gubbio, Italy, by Walter Alvarez, a geologist. And he collected this sediment layer in order to get, uh, he thought, maybe an age for it. And it was analyzed in his father's lab at Berkeley and uh, and they found a lot of iridium. His father was Louis Alvarez, physicist and Nobel Prize winner. And he got very interested in this iridium and he decided that this had to be a, la a giant meteorite impact that caused the mass extinction. And uh, Louis Alvarez was very good at promoting, at promotion, and he was a Nobel Prize winner and he would not take any, he doesn't take any prisoners, in other words, no, there was no toleration of any other views. And uh, he made pretty much a short shrift of anyone who dared to doubt, who dared to speak up. And uh, he would pride himself that he can destroy people. So there was this one guy that I knew then, he was a young assistant professor at Virginia Polytech at the time. His name was Dewey McLean. And he was uh, presenting his own idea, hypothesis, what caused the mass extinction. And that was that it was the Deccan Trap and the global heating. In 1980, at a meeting in Maastricht, Holland, he, uh, the two were supposed to present their hypothesis. And before, as Stewie McLean said, and it is uh, well documented um, the, uh, on internet by his own stories, he said to me, before the meeting, Louis Alvarez and his son Walter cornered me and said, so you are opposing us. And Dewey said, I'm not opposing you, I just have an, uh, an alternative idea, and I'm presenting that. And Louis told him, if you insist on presenting it, I will destroy you. Just as I, I destroyed a physicist Jastrow. Uh, and so when, when I'm through with you, you will be nowhere. Dewey gave the talk. And in due course, he was destroyed. Uh, he didn't get, um, uh, evidently, uh, Louis Alvarez called the chair, called the, maybe even the uh, president, told them that uh, he was, a, uh, Dewey McLean should never get tenure. He was uh, a lousy scientist uh, in public and New York Times interview, he called him a sissy, a pansy, 
a lousy scientist, a stamp collector, like all of us paleontologists. Uh, he, um, um, in, in effect, Dewey did not get tenure for many years. And uh, he had a nervous breakdown. He got very ill. He never recovered. He died last year. And uh, this is just one of them. It was an example to all the others not to oppose. And if anyone opposed, um, they, will be they would be dealt with. By, 90, by the late 1980s, there was virtually certainly nobody in the US that would dare to open their mouths to, uh, to criticize or have even alternative ideas, except for one other guy, and that was Chuck Officer from Dartmouth. Uh, Chuck uh, was a, a very good man. He was an um, uh, engineer by training. He had, big, he had in, invented the seismic sounding uh, that is used to test the uh, contours of sediments on the ocean floor. By uh, and his idea was you you uh, pull uh, shoot off explosives uh, behind your boat and track it and the waves go down into the, the ocean floor and through the sediments and then come back with the information of what it looks like. So after a few, this was of course a big bonanza for oil companies who were looking for oil. And uh, he sold his um, uh, inventions and became independently wealthy. So he took on um, basically geology, was his, he loved geology. So he took on this and he took on Luis Alvarez and the impact crowd. And he was ruthlessly dealt with. So he too was kind of drummed out but he's the one actually that kept me in in the field because by 1990 the discovery of the impact crater it seemed that uh, everything everybody seemed to believe now that this impact theory was correct and i figured there was no reason there was nobody else now that could stand up, and I was the only one. So why continue? I wasn't exactly a masochist. Chuck Officer called me every day, sometimes more than once a day, and told me, Gerda, you have to continue. You have to stay in. You have to go and check this out. So after a while, I agreed, and I said, OK, I will check it out, but I am not continuing in this. This doesn't make sense to me. I can't win. And uh, so I, uh, he, uh, Chuck wanted me to organize a field trip to Mexico to look at uh, what was reported as impact spherules. And uh, so we did in 1993. And uh, it seemed like, yes, there were impact spherules. But it didn't seem that they had looked at all the other interesting things that were found there. They just came up with a tsunami hypothesis to connect where the mass extinction was to where the impact spherules were meters below. And it didn't make, uh, it didn't seem right. So that's how, how I got back into it and the rest is history. Maybe if you could outline the evidentiary basis for these seemingly two opposing theories. Okay. The impact, the basis for the impact is the iridium anomaly, which I already talked about it, which is very tenuous evidence. Uh, impact spherules, which I just mentioned, but the impact spherules are throughout northeastern Mexico, always much uh, in sediments much older than the mass extinction. And for that matter, in Texas as well. And uh, apart from that, uh, there is um, uh, shocked quartz, 
But that's also very, very tenuous because shock ports you can have not just from impacts, but also from explosive volcanism because all it needs is high pressure. Apart from that, uh, there are, uh, there really isn't much else. They had the idea that there were wildfires caused, global wildfires, and that's a myth because it did not exist. There is evidence against that. I think that's just about it. They did not come up with uh, solid evidence. And what's the evidentiary basis for your theory or the theory of Deccan volcanism? Well, let's do first what, why the imp- why the impact theory doesn't hold water. The first is the, that the spherios are too old to be K- um, a KTH. The second is that the interpretation they came up with, that everything in between these spherios and the mass extinction was caused by a tsunami generated by the impact, doesn't hold because throughout the so-called tsunami, the sediments that are supposed to create have been created by the tsunami. There are evidence, like for instance, ash layers. You can't have volcanic eruptions in the area depositing thin ash layers during the time a tsunami is depositing the sediments over a few hours or days. So, and there are three of those. That's what we found way back in the 90s. Also, there were horizons of um, what was called burrowed. Uh, so, where it in is in, which is indication that the ocean floor was repeatedly colonized by different critters and that is all within this so-called tsunami deposit. You can't have ocean floor colonization during a few days or a few hours of a a tsunami. It's just not possible. Then uh, tsunami deposit, uh, deposits are very rare. For example, during this time when when all this was uh, explained as tsunami deposits, there a lot of money was expended by NASA as well as uh, National Science Foundations for people to travel around the world wherever tsunamis occurred and see what happened to the sediments that were uh, moved around and essentially how does a tsunami deposit look like. Well, guess what they found? They found that within a few days, even the largest tsunami deposits are eroded away and redistributed by waves. So that did not help either. So we we basically documented all the, the things that could not be explained by a tsunami um, for the, these deposits. And it was simply ignored. So by the, by, by the uh, middle 2000, I had done more or less everything I could do, and that's why I switched to India. There, every, uh, everything that did not fit with uh, the mass extinction and the Chicxulub impact, it seemed to fit with second volcanism. So there we, we could actually document the mass extinction between massive lava flows. And when I say massive, these were the longest lava flows in Earth's history. They traveled over a thousand kilometers across India and out to Rajamundri and into the Bay of, of Bengal. So it, it was not just volcanism, it was really, really massive. And then we had the age dates that confirmed it. And now we also have the mercury anomalies that confirm it. So if you set the two up against each other, it is pretty clear what happened, to me at least. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, one, one more thing. What would the scientists behind the impact theory say are weaknesses in Deccan volcanism? Right now, what, uh, what the impact folks are doing, they, their idea is 
they've already changed their hypothesis uh, or modified their theory, by the way. So what they're saying now is that the impact triggered Deccan volcanism. And that, uh, you may have heard of that. The problem is, the idea was that uh, Deccan volcanism is on the opposite of the Earth. And uh, so the impact on one side would shoot seismic waves through the Earth and uh, result in eruptions uh, in India. But um, India wasn't opposite. Indonesia was. Uh, that's one thing. But also, it's um, according to the physicists, it's impossible to trigger massive volcanism. You could trigger some potentially some volcanism somewhere if it was already ready to erupt. The other problem was that what, what exactly did it trigger? In India, the volcanism, major volcanic activity, major eruption started about a minimum of 300,000 years before the mass extinction and continued. They were uh, sometimes much larger than other times. It's ebbed and flowed, but it was continuous. And maybe with eruptions separated by a thousand years or sometimes a couple of thousand years. So which ones of these did the Chicxulub impact trigger? Now, now that we know that the major eruptions were right at leading up to the mass extinction, they could say the Chicxulub ha must have triggered those major eruptions. But how do you prove that? What we're curious about is hearing from you directly your experience in developing and advocating for a theory that directly challenged the status quo. Well, obviously I'm the bad girl. And uh, nobody is loved that destroys a beautiful theory. So it's uh, needless to say, um, I've been called many things and I've been opposed and vilified and character assassinations and rumors, including rumors that I was going to be fired at Princeton, rumors that uh, I was drummed out, all kinds of things. I've been called a bitch, a Danish bitch. I've been called um, that I should be stoned and burned at the stake. I've been called all sorts of things. And there have been concerted efforts, of course, to suppress my research, suppress uh, publications. It, um, but maybe this is all just human nature. Yes, sometimes it became personal, it seemed, and it was not easy at times, but then I didn't expect it to be easy. If you challenge a dominant theory and you have no more than yourself and a small team of students and some collaborators, you shouldn't expect um, an easy life. That's awful. That's awful to hear. Very sorry to hear that. Um, but that's the way it is. That's just the way life is. Um, I mean, I'm surprised that I have gotten as far as I have. I never expected to be recognized for it uh, during my lifetime. I call it uh, super delayed gratification. <laughs> Shifting gears a bit, could you ta talk about the impact of technology on your work? Uh, I think it's been fantastic because without modern technology and the most modern equipment and research in dating, we would not have the age control of the uh, Deccan volcanism that we now have. Without modern technology of this equipment to measure, very simply measure mercury in sediments, we would not be able 
to advance to the next state where we actually can uh, potentially identify volcanic eruptions in any marine sediments and link any environmental or climatic changes to to volcanic eruptions for that matter at any time in the past so it's um, then there are many others i mean without the improved technology for measuring climate change uh, without the technology we wouldn't be anywhere we would be still well fantasizing about how the dinosaurs got extinct moving to our last section and hopefully this is quicker than the others <laughs> <laughs> what motivates you discover what happens in the past i feel myself like a forensic detective working on cold cases except that my cold cases are millions and millions of years old but they're no less interesting and uh, how do you allocate your time how do i allocate my time my life is research no personal life my personal it's research my per, well my husband <laughs> we have a great time he's a math, very famous mathematician and uh, i know a lot less about mathematics and he knows about dinosaurs <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and we do a lot of hiking and traveling until he fell ill and um, we had uh, for the last 40 years a wonderful life and still do so that and my other passion are uh, is gardening i have a giant garden so when i when i get um, frustrated with science and frustrated with people i beat it out in the garden so nature is a common theme nature is a common theme yes I create uh, in the garden I create uh, images from my past growing up. I created iris fields. When I grew up I was uh, you know when goes iris fields well where I grew up there was one uh, just a few hundred meters from our house in a swamp area a huge field and I create recreated that in Princeton. Incredible. Among other things. I think we we might know at least one answer to this question and that would likely be Deccan volcanism but which non consensus views do you hold near and dear? Ah, <laughs> you were wrong. The truth. Yeah, uh, to uh, in in this controversy the truth is a non consensus view because the truth has never been acknowledged by the impact folks. they never acknowledge the the uh, all the things that don't fit their theory it's just been swept under the rug ignored and they do cherry picking whatever will fit them so the truth the sum of our accumulated evidence over the year years can't be explained by the impact theory so that's that's uh, what brought me actually and uh, in the end we find that the truth lies elsewhere and that is second volcanism so your answer is right right what's the biggest trade off in your professional existence <laughs> delayed gratification <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> let's face it it's taken over three decades in a younger generation uh that is not in- indoctrinated by the impact theory to open doors finally to alternative ideas to the mass extinction like volcanism and so maybe my delayed gratification will not have to wait until i'm gone <laughs> what are you currently reading well it's something called the trouble with physics by lee smolen I started reading this because I wanted to understand how major controversies evolve such as the impact theory and how they perpetuate in the face of so much 
contrary evidence. And I found the answers. What were they? <laughs> I knew you would ask that. Well, the answer is groupthink. Any of these major controversies, science controversies, were led by a strong man. It wasn't a strong woman, by the way. They were led by strong men, and they created essentially this uh, consensus, this group thing, where nobody could question anyone, could question the theory, number one. Uh, in group think, you were not uh, you're not allowed to go beyond and consider ideas outside the group. You're not allowed to, um, if you want to advance, you have to promote only that part. You ignore whatever else goes on, whatever does not fit. You attack and you try to destroy or ignore if you can't destroy it. So it's all the hallmarks of this controversy. And this Lee Smolens is describing from physics controversies. And it seems to hold across the board in sciences. What projects are you currently working on? I'm working, <laughs> you love this one. I'm working on uh, bringing together the final evidence that shows where uh, uh, when the Chicxulub happened and find it directly connected to the Deccan volcanism. And I will do that based on the mercury anomalies that we are measuring in all the localities around the Chicxulub impact. When are you unveiling that evidence? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> How can listeners learn more about your work? It's a good question. Uh, one of our scientists, and me included, we are not very good at writing for people who are not scientists or people who are not even in our neck of the wood of science. So I'm hoping that there will be very soon a documentary on the Deccan volcanism and the impact. And that, uh, I think, will become a, an excellent way of uh, letting people know where we stand on this issue. I'm also working on writing a book and hopefully write it so that anyone without an, a science background can understand it. But that's my wish and hope. Are you on Twitter, Professor? Um, I have a Twitter but I that some students set up for me at one time without my knowledge, yes. But I'm not doing anything. I'm I'm a terribly old fashioned person. <laughs> but people can at least log on to your website or, or your uh, faculty well, profile. They online. can always log on my website. I have tried to outlay the evidence in, a, in pictures and in as simple a way uh, of uh, explaining it as I was capable of. And by the way, we found that very helpful. Yeah. We, we started, we started there <laughs> and that's oh, how. Oh, that's very good. So, uh, so it wasn't, it was readable. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, I'm, I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts on the 2004 BBC documentary in which she participated? Do you feel it characterized and portrayed the issue correctly? I think for the time, it, uh, it was great because nobody, there are no other documentaries that have actually portrayed the our side, in other words, the evidence that doesn't agree with the impact. There never has been, there have been many attempts uh, virtually every year of uh, documentary filmmakers who have tried to get funding, but they never succeeded, simply because there is such a mafia out there that would only allow impact documentaries to be made. That is changing now. In fact, um, in a few weeks, uh, 
I will take my class on mass extinction studies uh, to India, to Deccan Traps, and uh, we will have some documentary filmmakers along. Something is in the happening. But it's still almost impossible for them or any filmmakers to get funding. So you guys in Silicon Valley really should step up. Maybe you can spread the word because this is still uh, an area where the impact mafia is still extremely strong. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening. Thank you.